While we're on the topic of antigen presentation, let's just briefly talk about a class of antigens which are known as superantigens. Superantigens can be produced by certain strains of Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. And unlike typical antigens, which need to be internalized within a cell and then processed through either the MHC class 1 or class 2 pathways, superantigens actually cross-link a T-cell receptor to an MHC molecule. Let's draw this out so you know what I mean. If this were the surface of our antigen-presenting cell, and this were the surface of our T-cell, we could draw out the familiar interaction between an MHC molecule presenting antigen and the T-cell receptor on our T-cell. When this is happening, a superantigen can actually come along and bind to both the MHC molecule and the T-cell receptor and stabilize their interaction. When this happens, there is an overpowering signal being sent into the T-cell nucleus which results in the release of excessive interferon gamma. And oh, just remember, if we wanted to, we can draw in what we know is missing here, right? This would be our CD3 complex. But anyway, back to the interferon gamma. This huge release of interferon gamma stimulates macrophages to inappropriately release interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. Remember these guys? These are the cytokines that function early in the course of an infection and result in fever, leaky vessels, and the production of acute phase proteins. Now the thing to realize is that this is usually a good response, but if you have so much IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha that all the vessels in the body become leaky, this is very, very bad. A patient's intravascular volume will plummet, and so will their blood pressure. And all of this results in shock, and ultimately organ failure. One of the most famous superantigens is known as toxic shock syndrome toxin 1, which can be produced by certain strains of Staphylococcus. The toxic shock syndrome was made famous when a certain brand of tampon allowed the growth of this staphylococcal species which then resulted in the death of several women because of the sequence of events that we just talked about. Just so you know, and for the sake of completeness, there are viruses which can produce their own kind of superantigen, but these don't seem to be involved in any known human diseases. Okay, moving on, let's just quickly mention antigen variation. This is also covered in microbiology, but we mention it here because this is a way that pathogens can evade the immune system. In the simplest sense, Certain bacteria, viruses, and parasites can swap or change major proteins found on their cell surface. When this happens, B cells, antibodies, and T cells, which are specific to those particular antigens, can no longer recognize the pathogen. And this, of course, allows the pathogen to reinfect the host. Typically, however, the immune system will kick into gear and recognize the new antigens, but this, of course, means that the patient will become sick again. Thus, it would be more precise to say that antigen variation allows pathogens not to exactly evade the immune system, but to evade the immune system's memory. Of course, part of the immune system's memory are the long-lasting antibodies that are produced following an infection, and that's something we'll look at here. When a B cell is fully activated in the course of an infection, it will mature into something that's called a plasma cell. Plasma cells are these sort of fried egg looking things that reside in the bone marrow and can secrete impressive amounts of antibody. Essentially, that's all they do, which is why they have so much rough endoplasmic reticulum. That's what I've tried to draw here in, the, in these squiggly lines. And I guess I should speckle them with ribosomes. So again, that's rough endoplasmic reticulum. And this is what we mean by active immunity. Active antibody immunity occurs because there's always some of this secreted antibody in the plasma and throughout the tissues of the antibody. Thus, if the same pathogen tries to reinfect the host, these antibodies can recognize it and neutralize it before an infection even occurs. By slow onset here, that the formation of these plasma cells and the production of their secreted antibodies happens in the later stages of an immune response. 
These cells and their antibodies can persist for a very, very long time. Antibodies produced against pathogens that you might have been infected with in childhood can still be detected late in adulthood. And that's, of course, what we mean by long-lasting protection. Passive immunity, on the other hand, refers to the administration or passing of antibodies from one person to another. The natural example of this is IgA in breast milk. When a mother nurses her child, IgA in the breast milk can actually begin to coat the GI. You might think, wouldn't IgA be digested by the baby's gastrointestinal tract? And yes, eventually it is, but actually IgA, because it's naturally found in the GI, is quite resistant to digestion. However, realize that there are no B cells in the baby that are producing IgA yet. Thus, the baby receives IgA from the mother, and there is no continual source or continual production of IgA. That's why we say that these kinds of antibodies, that is, passive antibodies, have a short lifespan. Like most things which are put into the body, these passive antibodies will eventually be cleared. However, passive antibodies are quite useful because they can be given immediately to a patient and can immediately begin working. And this is extremely important in diseases which cause permanent damage. That is, in cases where you want to neutralize the pathogen before it establishes any kind of infection. Thus, if a patient steps on a rusty nail or eats a bottle of contaminated honey or is exposed to HBV, that is, hepatitis B virus, or is bitten by a rabid animal, these patients will be given a dose of preformed antibodies in order to neutralize tetanus, botulinum, HPV, and the rabies virus.